This is a breakdown going beyond the headlines. I am Akisa Wandera. The 27th session of the United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP27, starts in a few days. We take a look at the significance of the conference, its achievements so far, and what to expect in this year's session. The drought in some parts of sub-Saharan Africa has been described as one of the biggest crises of climate change. But are there other human costs? And are they being addressed? We tell you all about it. And we take you to Kenya, where severe drought and raging floods are being experienced in equal measure. Welcome to the program. In November, leaders and environmental stakeholders from across the globe will congregate in the city of Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt for the 27th session of the annual United Nations Climate Change Conference, also known as COP27. But what is COP and what is its significance? Here's all you need to know. COP stands for Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC. It is the governing and supreme decision-making body of the UNFCCC whose primary goal is to combat climate change. The convention has near universal membership with 198 countries having ratified it. COP has regional representation from Africa, Asia, Latin America, the Caribbean and Europe. The first conference was held in Berlin, Germany in 1995 and has been held five times on African soil. Morocco hosted in 2001 and 2016, Kenya in 2006, South Africa in 2011 and now Egypt in 2022. The annual COP sessions have been instrumental in tracking progress made in stabilizing greenhouse emissions in the atmosphere to prevent human interference in climate change, allowing ecosystems to adapt naturally and enhance sustainable development. It is thanks to COP that the Kyoto Protocol of 1997 and the Paris Agreement of 2015, both of which aim to substantially reduce greenhouse gas emissions worldwide, were secured. In 2010, the Green Climate Fund was established to provide financial support to developing countries in their efforts to limit or reduce greenhouse gas emissions. During COP27, stakeholders shall seek to build on previous successes and pave way for future ambitions to effectively tackle climate change. Some of the key focus areas will be the promise of innovation and clean technologies and focus on centrality of water and agriculture to climate change. Stakeholders will also discuss the role of science in combating climate change along with energy transition, finance, biodiversity loss and decarbonization efforts. Between 2016 and 2019, Africa received 18.3 billion US dollars in climate finance. The goal by wealthy nations to mobilize 100 billion US dollars climate funds annually for emerging economies by 2020 was not met and the deadline was extended to 2023. Africa is hoping to push for more funds during the COP27. Mel Miendo reports. Africa needs 250 billion US dollars of climate finance annually. Out of the 100 billion US dollars of climate funds promised to developing nations by wealthy nations, only 18 billion was received. Africa got 20 billion between 2016 and 2019. Now, climate negotiators argue that the initial 100 billion US dollars allocated to Africa to finance climate change adaptation and, re and resilience is not enough. The African group of negotiators is asking for 1.3 trillion US dollars annually. Adaptation accounted for only 24% of total climate finance needs identified despite the continent's high vulnerability to climate change. Mitigation accounts for the largest share at 66% of total climate finance needs. The Center for Sustainable Development says that for Africa to follow a low-carbon, climate-resilient path, it will require major funding and investment in energy transitions and sustainable infrastructure, climate change adaptation and resilience, as well as restoration of natural capital through agriculture, food and land use practices. 
The continent would, however, need to invest around 200 billion US dollars annually on these priorities. The Green Climate Fund GCF financing, which is the world's largest source of global climate funding, has invested 3.8 billion US dollars to support developing countries in Africa, including Morocco, Malawi, Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda. The funds have been used to catalyze an innovative financing model for renewable energy, investing in climate smart agribusinesses to build farmers' resilience, and modernizing climate information and early warning systems. Research, however, shows that only 18% of GCF financing went to projects in the world's poorest countries. I'm now joined by Professor Kevin Urama, the Chief Economist of the Africa Development Bank. Thank you so much for joining us. How much money does Africa need right now for climate funding? Thank you very much uh, for having me. Um, Africa needs quite a lot of uh, resource financing for climate uh, change adaptation and mitigation. Our estimations in the African Economic Outlook shows that Africa needs up to 1.6 trillion US dollars to finance its uh, climate uh, uh, nationally determined contributions that was agreed in COP, in COP 21 only. Mm -hmm. And Africa is not really receiving that much climate finance to support its climate action. Professor, maybe take us through what does this money do for African countries? What is it used for? Climate uh, finance uh, are used for several things, including climate adaptation, which means building the capacity of the countries to be able to uh, uh, absorb the shocks of climate, uh, climate events when we have floods like is currently happening in Nigeria and in many parts of West Africa, or we have cyclones, or we have different kinds of climate action, uh, climate uh, uh, extreme events that affect countries. So this climate finance is supposed to bolster the country's capacity to be able to absorb these shocks and be able to recover um, going forward. But again, climate finance is also supposed to go to helping countries to transition to lower carbon emission uh, uh, development pathways, which we call low carbon pathways. And that low carbon growth pathways will require a lot of investments in new technologies, in renewable energy, in smart technologies that can allow countries to grow uh, their economies without emitting uh, so much of uh, CO2 emissions, which is damaging to the planet. Are there particular African countries that perhaps uh, would be prioritized for this funding right now? Climate finance is not flowing to countries that are most vulnerable to climate impacts. So the higher vulnerable countries are not receiving enough climate finance. So if you ask me, we need to actually re-engineer the climate finance architecture to ensure that it does what it was designed to do, which is provide support for adaptation and mitigation in the most climate vulnerable countries. Professor Rama, stay with us. I'll be coming back to you uh, shortly. At the COP26 summit, uh, climate summit in Glasgow last year, a deal was signed between South Africa and other governments from wealthier nations. South Africa was set to receive $8.5 billion to help end its reliance on coal. The partnership was expected to prevent up to 1 to 1 1.5 gigatons of emissions over the next 20 years to accelerate South Africa's transition to a low-emission, climate-resilient economy. In 2021, South Africa produced 87% of its electricity from coal, making it G20's most emission-intensive country. In the first five months of 2021, European countries imported 40% more coal from South Africa following the Russia-Ukraine war that led to high natural gas prices and global competition for the fuel. South Africa's cabinet approved an investment plan for $8.5 billion package just weeks to the COP27 summit, outlining the investments required to achieve the decarbonization commitments made in South Africa. And we're now getting back to Professor Urama. Can South Africa achieve a low carbon economy? South Africa can definitely achieve a low carbon economy if it implements its uh, uh, nationally determined con contributions as agreed in COP21. And the government of South Africa is doing quite a lot. A country that has been very dependent on coal 
um, has been investing quite a lot on renewable en in renewable energy financing. But to be able to meet that commitment that you talk about, there's a significant need for financial flows into South Africa. And also, basically, I mean external climate finance flows into mm. South Africa, as well as to other African countries. The nationally determined contributions that were agreed under the common but di differentiated responsibilities at COP21 presumed that 80% of financing for implementing that uh, contribution to climate uh, mitigation and adaptation will come from global climate finance flows. But currently, like I've mentioned at the beginning, mm. Africa is receiving very little compared to the, the huge needs that it requires to be able to address that. Professor, even as countries gear up for COP27, what conversations will help African countries jumpstart such plans as, say, what South Africa is doing right now? First, I would say that we need to focus on making real the commitment of delivering 100 billion to the developing countries by developed countries to address climate adaptation and mitigation. For me, that's a crucial point in terms of restoring trust in the climate discussions in itself. And then second, we also need to have a real dis discussion with regard to what it actually means to implement the NDCs. So that scale of 100 billion is simply not enough. Like I've mentioned, Africa needs uh, 1.6 trillion between now and between 2020 and 2030, meaning about 146 billion annually. And Africa currently receives about 18.3 billion annually. So if you calculate that, we find that we have above 108 billion US dollars in climate financing gap for Africa alone. Professor Rama, thank you very much for joining us here on The Breakdown and thank you for your time. We now take a short commercial break. When we come back, we take you to Kenya where severe drought and raging floods are being experienced in equal measure. Don't go too far.